Hi to everybody. This is the London Clojurians Meetup. Today we have today we have Daniel with us. She's gonna talk about discoverable hypermedia driven restful web services, obviously in Clojure. Uh, this presentation is gonna you know, detail a little bit about the REST paradigm with the hypermedia driven um, um, side of things. And uh, at the end, we're gonna have uh, some questions as well. So this video is going to be uploaded also on YouTube. If you are watching this from YouTube, please uh, like the video, subscribe to the to the channel. We post the new videos pretty much every every week or so. So Daniel, uh, the stage is all yours. You Thank can share your screen. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Uh, please do let me know if I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay, can you see my... Um, no, we uh, see the presenter notes. Nice, fantastic, okay. Fantastic, yeah. Great, okay, so, uh, so I'm Daniel. Uh, I work as a senior software developer at Crew. Um, so a flavor of this presentation was delivered uh, at a recent London Java community event uh, to Java developers uh, to encourage them to, to get involved and, and explore uh, closure. Um, and um, so, so hopefully this is going to be an easier sell and it will feel like almost preaching to the choir because we're all interested in, in closure. Uh, but hopefully you won't be bored because a lot of the, the libraries and a lot of the concepts presented here, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, also, some of the libraries that we're going to be presenting here, um, uh, the, the ones that we're building up on, on, on top, um, They've been out there in the closure sphere for a very long time. Uh, and there are probably better, more modern alternatives of, of, of libraries. Uh, the reason why uh, these the, the libraries that are going to be presented are the ones that will be presented is because um, essentially this presentation is almost like a field report of how crew builds microservices uh, in, in Clojure to build a new digital bank. Um, and I'm always uh, also looking for suggestions if uh, towards the, the, uh, the, the end of the talk, if um, anyone wants to hang around and have a conversation about uh, alternatives to some of the libraries or technologies that uh, will be presented here, I'm totally open to have a conversation. Um, so uh, I'm very lucky to be using Clojure in my new role uh, at Crew, and uh, you know, as I said, this this presentation, most of the content here, is inspired by some of the great work that my colleagues uh, did at Crew by building uh, some additional uh, sort of higher higher level uh, libraries on top of the already popular Clojure web libraries. Um, and I just wanted to get some, uh, I wanted to get the recruitment spiel out of the way before you all leave. Uh, so I'll maybe start with that. Um, so at Crew, uh, we're building a new digital challenger bank uh, in the UK, uh, built mostly with Clojure. Uh, so all of our microservices on the back end are all written in, uh, in Clojure uh, and deployed to AWS. And uh, our um, mobile applications are built with React uh, Native. Uh, we're not using Clojure script uh, yet. I mean, mostly for legacy reasons, uh, but that's not to say that we're not open to exploring that. Um, and we have a couple of thousand customers uh, uh, using the applications. Uh, we're now kind of ramping up and getting to the stage where we're becoming a real um, bank. Uh, and we're looking for all sorts of full stack developers. So um, if anyone's looking for a Clojure gig, uh, we're, we're open. Um, okay, so with that, I shall move on to the real presentation. So the, the purpose of this talk really is just to encourage you to explore uh, Hypermedia uh, as uh, the engine of application state for microservices in your organization. Uh, so um, HATOS, Hypermedia as the engine of application state, again, it's, it's a, not a new thing, uh, but it has been a concept that has been it had a, a profound impact on how I think about uh, APIs and the main state encapsulation in microservices. Um, so what we're going to do in this talk is we will demonstrate some closure code samples, uh, which 
by proxy, we'll also demonstrate how crew built microservices and how these microservices communicate with each other, uh, as well as some of the open source libraries that uh, my colleagues authored, as well as other probably already familiar to you, Clojure web libraries. Uh, so, um, but before we, we get to that, uh, a little bit of th theory. So, uh, so what is HATOS? Um, uh, so, f first of all, uh, for those of you not familiar with the Richardson uh, maturity model of REST APIs, um, Richardson maturity model uh, is a model developed by Leonard Richardson. It's something that I came across on uh, Martin Fowler's uh, uh, article with the same type uh, title. And basically what it does, it, it divides REST's, uh, REST into four different levels uh, of four levels that build on top of each other. Uh, so majority of us had some experience building a REST service. And, you know, it might have even been a public facing REST API with, with loads, of, lots of consumers, uh, lots of requests. Um, but more likely it was an internal API consumed by a handful of technical users of the system. Uh, probably sitting in a chair, chair away, um, or no, nowadays with COVID on the other side of the camera. Uh, and when we're developing REST APIs, most of us stop at level two of that Richardson maturity uh, model. Uh, so level um, level zero is essentially just us saying that we're going to be leveraging HTTP to, to build our RESTful API. Level one is where we're introducing the concept of resources, such as orders, and then you can address those resources by, uh, by the entity ID. Level two is where we're introducing some uh, extra semantics uh, by using HTTP verbs that you want to post to orders or delete a, sp a specific order. Um, and uh, a few times I, I saw teams not even really leveraging level two. Uh, so they will be essentially building almost like RPC, like remote procedure call, HTTP-based APIs, um, not really following the, those less uh, principles. And then, uh, you know, they would also argue that um, having various different status codes uh, coming back from their service just complicates their consumer code. So therefore, they're going to make everything a 200, regardless whether it's an error or, or, or a success, which I, I think that's probably not the best idea. So um, generally, if, if you build your APIs, like most of us do, up to that second level, you probably also use Swagger or something that helps you to, to document your APIs. Um, and you know that Swagger can deliver fantastic documentation up uh, up to and including that level two, um, but level three is really what this talk talk is, uh, talk is about. So um, it's about not just what we have, what APIs we have, but how we can interact with those APIs, and that's something that's very often missing in uh, in, in in Swagger. Um, and funnily enough, Hatua as being such an old uh, kind of concept, uh, it doesn't seem like it has really taken off that, that much and it actually addresses the how. So, so how to us, Happy Media is the engine of application state, a bit of an unfortunate acronym because of that hate in it. Maybe that's one of the reasons why it hasn't taken off. Um, it's not uh, a new technology concept. Uh, it's, uh, it's just an implementation of a wider web linking RFC. So in the HTTP RFCs, uh, there's an RFC called web linking that describes how, um, how you can introduce links uh, across HTTP requests. Um, it's language agnostic. So you, have, you might have come across it if you worked in a Java shop that utilizes Spring. I know there are a few uh, companies in London that uh, do Spring and they use Happy Media links. Um, and um, uh, right, and then so, so why would you use this uh, uh, Happy Media as the engine of application state? So that's the pros are that uh, uh, HTOS APIs uh, are traversable and explorable. Um, they are easy to, easier to extend, arguably. Um, and also, it's a bit easier with them to maintain backwards con con uh, compatibility and integrate with. Um, 
And uh, for me, it was the biggest one really is, is that it's not just the current flavor of the month API mechanism. It's basically just JSON with links. So uh, it's not like it's going to get out of fashion. Like we'll probably be using JSON for, for quite a long time. Um, so the disadvantages are that most likely it's not as exciting as GraphQL. You know, it doesn't try to solve these M plus one problems or uh, any way of sort of caching or anything like that. Uh, and they might not even be worth the effort to implement uh, how to us in your services. Um, especially if you don't have a lot of microservices or a lot of like technical users that uh, will be using those hypermedia links uh, to discover how the, the, the service actually operates. Uh, if you only have a, a bunch of um, API endpoints, maybe two or three services, it's just easier enough to like verbally explain what's out there and you're probably fine. But if you have, let's say, 40 microservices, lots of different domain services, and uh, you know, you, let's say you're uh, you're jumping, you're pairing with a new person on the new service on the new kind of epic, and you just want to find out what that API uh, allows you to do. Uh, you you'll be able to just easily find out by yourself by just following a bunch of links uh, coming from the service. So, so then, in order to uh, to build those links and um, surface those those links from your API service. Um, you need some standard. Uh, so to do that, uh, I think the most popular standard out there is HAL, Hypertext Application Language. Uh, it's just one specific convention for expressing hypermedia controls over the rest. Um, it describes how in your JSON, uh, how the next uh, links and the embedded resources and the collections and, and versions all should look like. So it effectively gives you like a convention on how, how do you go about building a hypermedia driven uh, API. Um, so here's an example from, uh, from the HAL RFCs. Um, so given you send a request to slash orders, um, this is the, the JSON response that we get back. So you have a bunch of nested properties. Um, first of all, we have links. So link to itself, a link to the next resource, next page, uh, a link that describes how to find a specific order, as well as uh, in this particular example, they're actually returning um, the orders directly from that request uh, and also returning a bunch of embedded uh, resources with it with links to how to retrieve, for example, the related customer, the related basket, uh, and things like that. And also following the whole, uh, whole convention. So essentially you can very easily build a wrapper library around this to interpret this and actually walk, almost walk these API uh, requests without actually having to write uh, like very kind of declarative um, codes to fetch one thing after the other. Um, so, okay. So now, now with the theory out of the way, uh, let's have a look at some code, uh, code samples uh, and at some closure. Um, so in our sample closure microservice uh, project, um, just like a majority of closure services or web services out there, uh, the first two levels, uh, level zero and level one are implemented using uh, a Jetty embedded server using Ring. Uh, and Ring, uh, as you probably all know, it's just an interface between your closure app and the web server that's actually serving content. Um, but also we're gonna be using Biddy. Uh, Biddy is, is uh, Jack's uh, excellent uh, bidirectional routing library. Uh, and it will give us a way to specify our routing as closure data structures. Um, but we, what we're gonna use it for is to actually um, uh, feed it to another library uh, and so that bidirectional traversability of your BIDI routes is what, what's going to be essentially driving uh, the creation of our hypermedia uh, links. So, um, so going clockwise, uh, on the first image, uh, we have a definition of our endpoint routes. Uh, so mapping URLs to, to keys uh, in BIDI. Uh, so this is this is just a simple um, closure persistent vector with a with a map. 
uh, where you know we, we're mapping, uh, we're creating a very basic sort of endpoint. We have a root endpoint um, um, slash uh, mapped to discovery keyword that's later going to be map mapped to this discovery uh, resource, or discovery controller. We have a ping and we have orders. And then for orders, we, we also have orders for a specific order ID. Uh, on the second image, uh, we have a function that returns mapping of these uh, keywords like discovery, ping, orders, order into um, liberator resources. Um, so, and, and then on the final uh, final image, we have a go function that's setting up some tracing and just kind of wires everything um, together. So it starts a Jetty server. Um, it it gives it, it hands it uh, the result of the biddy's make handler uh, function. Um, and um, and that's essentially what ties our um, liberated resources on the top right uh, with the biddy roots on the top left. Uh, so this is kind of just just a starting point. Um, so, uh, please bear, me, bear with me. This presentation was initially delivered to the London Java community. So probably for those of you, or for, for most of you, you might have seen this image uh, before. Uh, but I wonder, can, can anyone guess what that is? Or, or anyone, who, anyone who hasn't used Liberator, I suppose. That's uh, the state machine for HTTP responses. That's right. So, so this this flowchart demonstrates uh, a sample of decisions and responses you, you will typically have to handle when you're implementing an HTTP API, and your browser actually implements uh, in that to an extent. Um, so every web browser out there will basically handle all these different conditions and uh, that, that whole state machine. Uh, needs to be implemented in order to, to fulfill these HTTP RFCs. And so should your service. Uh, if you're building uh, microservices for your organization and you're not implementing uh, at least a portion of, of these different uh, actions and decisions, you probably have bugs in your microservice. It might be fair to assume. Um, it's a bit of, bit of a bold statement, but... Why not? Um, so level level two of the Richardson maturity model is is actually uh, really complex. Um, so in order to to make this a little bit easier on us when we're building microservices or web services out there, um, Erlang introduced uh, a library uh, um, called Web Machine, uh, and um, Basically, in, in Erlang's web machine, you can declaratively specify your resource functions and decisions and responses. And uh, now correct me if, if I'm wrong, there might be a, the, the original author of Liberator on, on, on the skull. Uh, but I think it's probably safe to assume that the Clojure's fantastic Liberator library that we're actually using uh, in, in Anger at, uh, at Crew um, has borrowed some of these ideas from, from the web machine. Uh, and essentially ported it onto Clojure and, and, and JVM, making this absolutely fantastic library called uh, called Liberator. So, level two uh, is where Liberator uh, comes in place. So, so Liberator is a Clojure library which helps you build an RFC compliant um, controller or, or resource handler, and um, well, it offers you pretty much the the same thing as that Erlang's web machine that I mentioned, uh, but prettier because it's closure. So it's mostly uh, functions. And um, so you specify functions to make decisions and actions. And the library essentially takes care of um, walking every request through that really complex uh, decision graph. So if we just look at an example of, um, of the, the order uh, resource handler, um, so in this example, we, we have a few decisions uh, such as allowed methods and exists, as well as some actions. Uh, so handle, uh, handle okay and handle not found or handle exception. So 
each decision and action is just a simple function that either returns a truthy value in case of decision, or in our case, it returns a hull JSON object as the return value. And then that hull JSON object is what gets uh, sent back to the client with an appropriate status code uh, by Liberator. So essentially, by using, by combining BD and Liberator and then uh, HAL hypermedia application language objects, we're able to, to, to build um, a web service that's a lot more compliant with the RFC than if you were just basically building all of that from scratch by just defining the kind of roots, uh, roots yourself. Um, so then, what comes next is level three. So the hypermedia, um, hypermedia links in, in our API. So in order to, to generate and parse those HAL uh, and JSON content type responses, uh, my uh, colleagues at, at Crew uh, altered, uh, altered the closure library, but also JavaScript library called uh, HALBOY. Uh, it's available on, on GitHub. Uh, you, you can use it in, in Clojure, in your Clojure server applications, um, client applications that send requests to, uh, to HAL JSON uh, compliant APIs, um, but also on the client side with the Halboy JS library. Um, it provides functions to build and interpret HAL resources, uh, but it also has utilities to navigate uh, HAL resources. So one of, one of the beauties of uh, hypermedia links is that they can be uh, navigated and they can be navigated either uh, by you manually through Postman, which I, I find particularly useful whenever I'm working with a new service, I can just fire up Postman. I send the request to slash the root resource on a given service. And then that gives me all the links and all the basically documentation, almost like in Swagger. I mean, it's missing a few bits and bobs that Swagger would provide you in this, uh, this case, fair enough, but there's nothing stopping you from having Swagger alongside it uh, as well. Um, so working with HAL would be very painful if you were if you didn't have any utilities to easily generate links, uh, because there's a lot of links and uh, doing links can be quite difficult because obviously every environment that you're going to be in development, pre-production, production, uh, you know this is kind of where service discovery comes comes in play. But that can be really complicated, and for, for majority of our organizations, you probably well, it's it's arguable whether you're ever going to get to the point where you're going to have like a real kind of service discovery where you'll be able to inject um, different URLs. Um, so they, um, so my colleagues at Crew also built a companion library uh, called Hype, and uh, Hype works with BD uh, with BD Roots, and allows us to very easily build. Um, a link uh, based on the request context. So, so whenever you get the request, you get this request object. And within that, you have a bunch of information about your environment. So you know precisely like what the host name is, for example. So by combining BIDI and um, so, so the BIDI roots and the request context and uh, a map of links, uh, you can very easily generate those hypermedia links. So that's, uh, that's what hype does. Um, so here is an example of a slightly more complicated liberator. Well, complicated, but not complicated. From a liberator standpoint, this resource handler is way easier because it only has one decision, allowed methods. So every request that comes in, as long as it's a get, it will be allowed. If not, then liberator will automatically send the appropriate status code and will reject it. But assuming that it's a, it's a get request, to, to that root endpoint, um, what we're doing is we're assembling a new HAL resource object. So this is using the, the HALBOY library. So we're, we're essentially creating a, a new resource we, uh, with a initial self link uh, using HYPE library. So we're generating an absolute URL for the discovery BIDI root. Um, that gives us a link uh, and then uh, a new resource. We then thread it into 
uh, another function called add links, where we just add a bunch of additional links in there, again, using um, BD roots, the request context map, um, and, uh, and also the keyword of the BD resource that we're interested in. Okay, so basically given this, given this controller, this is what you will see if you send a request to the send point. So you will get um, a response, a JSON response, uh, with a bunch of links, self, ping, orders, order, which is interesting because it has this templating in it, uh, which as you can imagine, that's quite easily, again, traversable because those templates are standardized. So whenever you see a template like this, you know you will be able to quite easily replace that with, with the actual order ID or whatever that comes in into that template. Um, right, and, and this is kind of how you would then go about consuming it. So um, now imagine that in another service, you want to send a request to this uh, item service. Uh, and uh, essentially the way you would then interact with it, you start the conversation with that service by sending a request to that root endpoint. Uh, and here we're using Navigator. Navigator is, is a utility, well, it's an object within the Hellboy library, um, which essentially just uses, uh, I think by default, it uses HTTP, HTTP kit underneath. It sends a request to the endpoint, it gets those links, um, and then within, within it, it just um, then knows that if I want to follow up by sending a, a request to orders, I don't need to actually send, I don't need to send a request to the orders endpoint. I just uh, pass the orders keyword in and I'll be able to uh, to send a request to, to orders without caring about what the host name is uh, and how to actually address it. So in this particular case, actually, what we're doing is we're hitting the discovery endpoint, um, and uh, we're, we're adding some additional headers, and then uh, we're calling navigator get on the items uh, root. Okay, so then to tie it all together, um, to tie it all together, I wanted to show you a little demo of how I'm actually. Um, exercising this uh, little uh, demonstration project that I have hosted on my GitHub page uh, called Hull Liberator Jaeger. So I'm going to try and share my other uh, tab. That's OK. Okay, so let's have a look. So this is um, this is Hull Liberator Jaeger, uh, which is a uh, an example um, Hull Liberator and also Jaeger for distributed tracing project that I have on my GitHub page. Um, and just before the presentation, I just uh, fired it up by running Docker Compose app uh, that basically spins up. Uh, two microservices, the item service, the order service, uh, as well as the all-in-one uh, Jaeger uh, uh, server. So uh, we'll also get some distributed traces between those requests. Um, so and just to, without really telling you too much about the service, let's just see what's in, inside of the service. So can you guys see my Postman? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, amazing. So we, we start the conversation by sending uh, a get request to the um, slash, the, the, the root endpoint, the discovery resource on our order service. Uh, so if all is well, this is the response that we're saying. So we're saying um, that these are the, the available links um, links within it. So let's, let's have a look at what happens if we follow uh, and we try to send this get to orders. Okay, cool. So, so we're getting back some some initial sample uh, sample order for uh, apples and oranges. Um, within that, we're getting the self link to orders. Uh, we're getting uh, a link back to the discovery endpoint if we wanted to follow back to, to see um, to see what what else is in there. Um, but also, we're getting a link to 
the details of that specific order. So, um, so from orders, we get this list of orders. So we can uh, follow along to go to orders one, two, three. We send a request to that. And then here we get details of, um, uh, of, of the specific order. So it has some extra information. It has that, uh, well, the same name that we already had in the previous request, uh, but it also has um, itemized uh, collection of items within the order. And what's interesting is uh, these items, uh, they're actually hosted within the item service. So they live in a different closure application, which is running alongside. Uh, so each each one of the apps is running in, in a separate Docker container. Um, so let's uh, let's let's have a look. So uh, in order to, to keep this demo repo quite simple, I didn't add any nginx uh, server or there's no complicated routing, um, and my Docker compose basically just exposes it as uh, as item service, but item service won't actually be reachable, so I have to change this to 3132. Uh, but in a normal real production system, you wouldn't have this problem because you will be getting the, the correct URL. Uh, but effectively, you'll be getting like, uh, you know, a, a DNS, um, some sort of DNS record. Or maybe if you're running on Kubernetes, there'll be basically like an internal service link or something like that. And these would just easily keep, keep on going. But with this example repo, there's, there's nothing um, nothing there to handle that. Um, but anyway, so we just went from one service to the other without actually having to know any of, of the details of how these services are linked simply by traversing data instead of the, the JSON responses. So, um, so, so let's have a look. So now that we're on the item service, we can now uh, also send a request to the discovery endpoint of the item service. And just to see what's out there, okay, I can get some, uh, I, can, I can get the items directly and then I can get the specific item details as well. Great, okay, cool. So we, we now kind of get the, the general idea of how this API is, uh, is struct, uh, structured. However, uh, what would be interesting to see is given that I started exploring it and I went to one service, I went to another service, I would also like to see the topology of these services. So I wanna see how, uh, you know, how does this kind of map of services actually uh, looks like. So um, H2S and HAL is not gonna help you with that. Uh, so this is kind of where we have to take it uh, take it up uh, up a notch, um, and um, so th so this is this is where Jagger or distributed tracing um, comes in play. Um, so every request between between services is annotated by um, an open consensus library, a closure library. Uh, developed at the U switch. Uh, and uh, additionally, every service uh, automatically just by enabling the tracer is able to trace all the standard sort of uh, JDBC connections and things like that without you actually having to write any, any code whatsoever. Uh, but for our simple example, let's just have a look what sort of traces we managed to collect. Well, actually, let's have a look at the system architecture. That, that might be quite interesting. So uh, our tracer um, has recorded that our topology of microservices consists of the order service and the item service. And this is more or less the di direction of requests. Um, this is the uh, directed the silly graph for that. And uh, let's, let's have a look at some distributed spans, this distributed traces. Okay, so let's have a look first maybe at the, the order service. It seems like it was a little bit slow. Uh, maybe we'll be able to see something in here. So uh, so there has been some requests to orders one, two, three. And then uh, within that, we can actually see this span broken down into the, the, in, the individual kind of operations within that. So the overall time it took to send re from request to response was about 500, uh, 700 milliseconds. 
and that consisted of um, a call to get all orders function, whatever that was, and then uh, a call to get items function. And at that point, it looks like we crossed the boundary. We actually went from the order service to the item service. So it looks like the majority of the time spent around 600 milliseconds was actually on the networking. So we spent all the time on the wire. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously the the Docker Compose networking that I have in this sample project probably is not working very well. Um, but anyway, so uh, the point of this is uh, that with uh, JSON on the hypermedia links within your JSON responses, you can build this really excellent, uh, easily discoverable um, API that anyone with the Postman, uh, with access to Postman can just poke your API and see what's what's available out there. And then if you then couple that with um, something like any sort of APM uh, application performance monitoring solution, whether it's Jaeger, uh, you know, open tracing, open telemetry, open consensus, um, or if you use something like New Relic or Datadoc uh, out of these like enterprise solutions, you'll be able to build uh, services that are very easily observable uh, as well as discoverable. Um, okay. So let me just go back to my presentation. What am I showing? Am I showing the... Yeah, the presentation is okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so in the distributed tracing land, it's a bit of a mess right now, uh, to be completely honest with you, because there's open tracing, uh, there's open consensus, which I believe is what Google was using internally and developed internally for, for a lot of this stuff. Uh, open tracing was mostly about distributed traces and open consensus was about metrics and distributed traces. It's kind of like an extension of, of that. Um, and um, there are excellent libraries uh, out there uh, that I've used in production for open consensus, actually developed by, uh, by some, some folks at Uswitch. Uh, in fact, the uh, HAL Liberator, Liberator Jaeger sample project that I demonstrated here, which is available on my GitHub that you can just clone and just Docker compose up uh, to, to, to run it. It's actually using the open consensus uh, use switch library. Um, but there's a new initiative to, to create uh, a new standard uh, called open telemetry. Uh, it's, it has been, uh, I believe, uh, the first production grade ready uh, Java as the case have been released in 2020. And there's a new library called CLJ telemetry, uh, but I think it's probably fair to say that it's quite immature. It's only, it only wraps like two or three, uh, two or three kind of methods from from the Java uh, Java SDK. Um, uh, but but uh, you know, there's definitely options in in Clojure to to do this. Um, uh, right, and that was the demo uh, of. Um, Hellboy, Hype, um, kind of brief intro to Richardson maturity model and how that sort of maps to Liberator, to Biddy, to, to Ring, but also HathOS. And then as a kind of cherry on top, uh, a bit of distributed tracing on how you can really kind of uh, expose your APIs so that they're properly discoverable. Uh, so this is the this is where you can find the project if you want to just poke it with a stick and uh, you know you can clone it you can docker compose app and that will basically spin up uh, the Jaeger ser server and also um, two other containers the item service and the order service uh, and all the examples on those slides were basically just screenshots from 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 this repo so feel free to to play around and that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the interesting talk. So before we, we jump to the questions, um, so I'm gonna stop the, the recording of the video. And um, if you're watching this from YouTube, 
uh, please remember to send the feedback, whether you like it or not, to subscribe to the channel. We upload a new video pretty much every week. And uh, if you want to speak at the London Clusurians, feel free to uh, get in touch with, uh, with us through the Meetup page, and we'll set up a, a talk for you. So having said that, so thank you to everybody. Uh, we stopped the recording.